thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you this evening. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a subject I'm rather passionate about, which is the deep sea. But uh, actually, a part of this topic is something I've never really given a, a talk about before, and that is the ethical dilemmas that face scientists about whether to engage with the seabed mining industry. So what I, what I want to do, and let me go back here and just say, really, this is a talk about the future. There has not been any seabed mining in the ocean yet, but we're on the verge. And so hopefully I'm going to explain to you what this is all about. I want to tell you just a little bit about the deep ocean. Many of you may not know much about it. Uh, I want to tell you about the resources that are down in the deep ocean and why there's a growing demand for these. I want to talk about who owns those mineral resources and what role scientists might play in, uh, in the whole process of exploiting those resources and the ethical conundrums that we face. So I'm going to start with the deep ocean. Well, actually, I'm going to start with the ocean, which many of you may know represents 70 percent of the surface area of our planet. Um, and most of the ocean is, in fact, deep ocean. And we call anything below about 600 feet the deep ocean, or 200 meters. And it turns out that this area below 600 feet represents over 95% of the habitable area on this planet. And that's because the ocean is vast and very deep. The deepest part is almost 11,000 meters, or 33,000 feet deep. So what do we know about the deep ocean? Well, before anybody explored it, there were a lot of perceptions about mystery, terror, sea monsters, and maybe some inspiration along with that. But in about uh, 1850, the first ships began to uh, explore the deep sea with large expeditions. And for the first 100 years of ship exploration, what emerged was a picture of a very homogeneous, mud-covered, cold, desert-like environment. People thought it wasn't a very interesting place. However, the last 50 years have changed that perception completely. We now have a lot of tools that have shown us an amazing wealth of different ecosystems down in the deep sea. We've discovered hydrothermal vents. We've discovered that cold water corals make massive reefs that support animal life. We've discovered low oxygen zones. We've discovered underwater volcanoes called seamounts, tens of thousands of these on the seafloor. We've discovered canyons that support lush gardens of filter feeding animals. We've discovered areas where methane seeps out of the seafloor and supports life. Reefs made of sponges, dead whale, carcasses and other organic falls support strange communities. So all of these ecosystems we now know support a huge range of biodiversity, animal life on the seafloor. Over those 50 years, well, really 150 years now, we've come to understand that the deep ocean is different than shallow water. There are many special features. Part of this comes from simply the vast areas. The deep sea goes on for thousands of kilometers. Much of it's very remote and isolated from people. This means it's expensive, it's difficult to get to, and so there have been relatively few expeditions down there. Um, and what this means is we are never going to see all of the deep sea. We've probably seen something like 5% of the sea floor at this point, but it does mean that all the animals down there will never be characterized. We won't know all the biodiversity ever. Um, as I've shown you, there's high heterogeneity. It's not just one monotonous habitat, but a whole series of different ecosystems. We've discovered that many of the species down there live for a very, very long time. For example, the fish, the deep sea fish, often can live over 100 years, sometimes even two to 200. But this is nothing compared to some of the invertebrates, like the corals and sponges that can live literally for thousands of years. I just saw an article a month or two ago about an 18,000-year-old sponge. 
just incredible. So it makes us think about uh, what happens if we remove those. <laughs> We've also, with all our recent exploration, discovered that there are an amazing amount of minerals down on the deep sea floor. And here's a list of some of these, but this is a map showing you minerals from the three major habitats, polymetallic nodules from large abyssal plains. These are these small potato-sized nodules that cover vast areas of the ocean at hydrothermal vents. There are massive sulfides that have minerals. And on seamounts, there are cobalt crusts that have minerals. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about these. But I do want to say that the demand for these um, in the deep ocean has grown. And this is a result of what I call the industrialization of the deep ocean. And it really, at its root, is population growth. When I was five years old, there were 3 billion people on this planet. And now there's over, I think, seven and a half billion. So the population is more than doubled, and it's continuing to grow. And as it grows, we know that humans do things like release carbon dioxide. We're changing the climate. But we also demand more food, more energy, and more raw materials for all of the products that we make. And in particular, our advanced uh, economies require huge amounts of metals and rare earth elements. So things like computers and cell phones require nickel, gold, copper, zinc, cobalt, and more. And strangely enough, some of our um, green technologies, like hybrid car batteries or solar cells or wind turbines, they require rare earth elements like lanthanum and neodymium. And as we deplete these elements on land, we look to the shallow waters. And then as we deplete things in shallow water, we look to the deep sea. We're also looking to to the deep sea for new pharmaceuticals, new antibiotics. We're looking for military applications and at various kinds of industrial processes. They've recently found a microbe down there that can scrub CO2 that people are now thinking of putting in industry stacks. And it used to be that the deep ocean was really inaccessible, that we couldn't get there. It was too expensive. We didn't have the equipment. But that's really changed in the recent decades. Thanks to satellite-guided GPS and new mapping tools, um, new kinds of infrastructure, new ways of looking at the ocean, like remotely operated vehicles and new mining tools that are being developed, we now can pretty much go anywhere in the deep ocean and get anything we want. OK, well, who owns all those resources? The ocean is carved up into different jurisdictions. And 148 countries own some of the deep sea resources. All the areas in blue within 200 miles of their shoreline are called exclusive economic zones. And, um, and they're owned by many countries. And some of those countries have claimed extended continental shelves, these areas you see in red. But 60% of the ocean falls in what we call international waters, or areas beyond national jurisdiction. And the resources here are owned in different ways, depending on the resource. On the seafloor, the minerals are managed by the International Seabed Authority, but they're owned by everybody, all of us, you, me, every country of the world. And they're called the common heritage of mankind. Anybody who wants to access those resources, those minerals, have to share the monetary benefits with the whole world. But as I said, they're managed by the Seabed Authority, and this region is called the area. There's been a rising interest in these minerals, and there's been, in, especially since 2005, increasing numbers of claims for seafloor in international waters. There are not, now 27 exploration claims um, with 22 contracts for the different types of resources that I've met, um, mentioned. And we're now moving from the exploration stage, moving um, quickly towards exploitation, which hasn't happened yet, as I said. And we're, we're in the process of developing environmental regulations. And when I say we, I really don't mean me. I mean the International Seabed Authority. 
and scientists. So this shows you where some of those exploration claims are. There's a vast number of them in abyssal plains off Mexico. There are some in the um, Northwest Pacific on seamounts. There are some in, uh, on the rid mid-ocean ridges in the Indian Ocean and in the Atlantic Ocean and even off Brazil. There are some cobalt crest claims. So they fall all over the world. And, but mainly, as I said, into three types of ecosystems. The polymetallic nodules occur below low productivity areas, and they cover thousands of kilometers. Um, and these are potato-sized nodules. I meant to bring one, actually, to show you, but I forgot. Sorry. Um, and scientists are used to think this was a desert out there. They didn't, they didn't see much when they looked. But once they started sampling, they realized the nodules themselves were a habitat to a whole wealth of invertebrate biodiversity, including some giant protozoans, single-celled animals like this one, xenophyophores. Copper, zinc, cobalt, nickel um, are, are the main um, mineral resources of interest in this environment. At hydrothermal vents, hot vents um, on the seafloor, there's rapid precipitation of copper, zinc, lead, silver, and gold. And so there's interest in mining hydrothermal vents now. And then on seamounts, I mentioned um, cobalt crusts. They're actually, sometimes they're called ferromanganese crusts with copper, nickel, molybdenum, and cerium. And this is what they look like, just black crusts on top of the seamount rocks. But these environments all support a wealth of life in the deep sea as well as the minerals. The most crowded and area of greatest interest is the clarion clipperton fracture zone. It's located right here off of Mexico in sort of the subtropical Pacific, East Pacific. And this shows you all the different claims that are out there. And these areas are huge. Some of these claims, well, most of these claims are the size of small countries in Europe. Um, they're, they're really large. And you can see this list of countries that have state exploration claims out there. Um, and, and some of these have more than one area that they've claimed. These hatched areas are APIs, areas of particular environmental concern, interest, which is code for protected areas. So they have protected these areas from seabed mining so that there will be parts of the seafloor that aren't disturbed. But to give you an idea of how vast the extent is of these, if you superimpose these on the United States, they basically stretch from one end of the United States to the other. So we are looking at really, really large tracts of seafloor. And to give you an idea, again, of the, the magnitude that mining, the magnitude of area that would be disturbed by mining, this is the size of the largest coal strip, strip mine in Germany. Looks like that. And this is how much would be mined by a single claim in one year in the clarion clipperton fracture zone in five years, in 10 years, and in 20 years, which is assumed to be the life of a deep sea bed mine. Now, so where do scientists fit into this picture? I was actually invited here to talk about science and ethical issues surrounding seabed mining. Well, it turns out the International Seabed Authority under the UN law of the sea fondly known as UNCLOS, is mandated to protect the environment um, under Article 145. It's required to adopt measures that ensure the effective protection of the marine environment from the harmful effects which may arise from seabed mining. The ISA is required to prevent, reduce, and control pollution, to um, maintain the ecological balance of the marine environment. I'm not going to read all of these, but you get the idea. They have to protect and conserve the natural resources of the area. The area is the seafloor, international seafloor. And, and they really um, have to, are, are mandated to do this at the same time that they are responsible for facilitating the um, mining of those resources. So where do scientists come in? 
Well, scientists are often employed by the mining contractors to conduct what we call baseline studies, which involves characterizing the ecosystems, the biology, geology, and chemistry of these environments, and sometimes also to help prepare environmental impact assessments, which are required. Um, Many scientists are providing independent input to the International Seabed Authority about the development of environmental regulations. I co-lead a group, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, that does this. Um, a number of scientists also are conducting independent research, separate from the contractors, that is revealing uh, information about the basic science of the regions, but also about the effects of mining. And scientists also can advise their governments about what to do and what kinds of decisions to make about mining. Some of the science that's coming out is making it very clear that seabed mining has harmful effects to marine life. It changes the substrate, the surfaces that animals live on. It changes the geochemistry that control what kinds of animals can live where. It uh, creates these huge sediment plumes that might clog the fe feeding apparatus of different animals in the deep sea. It creates breaks in connectivity by removing whole populations. Um, and, and, uh, and this could lead, in some cases, to extinction of animals that aren't very well dispersed. It creates loss of the biological structures that make habitat for other animals. And, um, and we know that the very long-lived nature of many deep sea animals means that they won't have much resilience to disturbance. And it, and it might take very long periods to recover if they ever recover at all. There's been a little bit of testing done in these habitats to look at recovery rates. And in the manganese or the polymetallic nodule provinces, this, this test track was made 26 years earlier before this picture was taken. And basically, there was no recovery. The, the scars were still sharp. Sediment hadn't filled it in. And when they sampled the animals, all the different sizes of animals, even the bacteria, hadn't recovered after 26 years, which tells us that any mining in this environment is likely to be pretty much permanent damage on human time scales. We can't expect those environments to recover. OK, so, so I'm going to talk about some of the ethical issues that the scientists face. But in reality, these are also societal issues, as society has to make decisions about whether to mine the deep ocean as well. Um, and, and the scientists, uh, I, I should start by saying that probably half of all the deep sea biologists that I know have been working with the, their nations and the mining contractors to do baseline work. There aren't very many deep sea biologists out there. And many feel that if this fundamental char first time characterization of these ecosystems is going to be done, it should be done by experts so that there's basically quality assurance. That's the only way we're going to know what's there now. And if mining begins, be able to accurately study the impacts. Um, the other probably. Uh, inducement to do this kind of work is that most of the areas being targeted for, for mining or for exploration have a, never been studied before. They offer scientists a chance to look at that 90, some of that 95% of the seafloor that we've never seen. Um, and it's turned out to be amazing, revealing huge amounts of biodiversity that we never knew existed in places like those nodule provinces. So, so that's one side. And those are some of the motivators for scientists to work with the contractors. On the other side of the issue are people that feel that anything you do with a mining contractor, um, which often is the nations themselves, um, and they're working with private firms, um, that anything you do promotes mining. And, and the question comes, does the scientist's effort actually accel accelerate the development of this new extraction industry. Um, many believe that this is an environment we know so little about. We don't know enough to predict whether or how or how long it would take to recover from mining. 
um, and that the precautionary principle would tell us that we shouldn't perturb these ecosystems at all. So these are sort of two sides of the issue, and you know, different scientists come down on, on different sides of this. Another question is whether scientists should help the International Seabed Authority develop environmental regulations for deep seabed mining. So many believe that if, if the scientists don't weigh in, it's likely that the regulations won't really be sound and they might not provide sufficient protection for the marine environment. And the alternative is that if we do weigh in with the ISA, are we promoting the seabed mining industry? So you can see the conundrum here. There's no, there's no easy way out. Um, you know, you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't at some level. And as I said, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative uh, mineral, has a minerals working group that spends a lot of time trying to uh, provide advice about environmental regulation to the ISA. I want to give you one more interesting example. Um, sometimes when scientists try to say what they know to be true or to publish this, they get in trouble. And I was involved in this paper that got published last month called Deep Sea Mining with No Net Loss of Biodiversity and Impossible Aim. That's the message of the paper right there. In this paper, we talked about the proposal that had been made to offset deep sea biodiversity loss with reef balls in coral reef ecosystems to create new biodiversity in coral reef to replace the lost deep sea biodiversity. And we argued that that couldn't happen. Well, the, um, when I say industry can lash back, this is not the mining industry. This is the restoration industry who makes the reef balls gave us a cease and desist message. Um, uh, I mean, and really, you can read. I just put, put the email that they sent, threatened legal action. So scientists, normally we don't get involved in anything like this. This is kind of um, new, for, new territory for us. And this poor first author, who I think is um, actually a PhD student, threw up her hands and ended up seeking legal advice from our, all our other institutions, Duke and Scripps and various places on what to do about this. So. Um, in, in reality, there wasn't probably a, much of a problem because the things we said were accurate. But uh, So scientists and society, not just scientists, but really society is facing decisions about whether to go ahead with deep seabed mining. And it's a real problem. How do we balance the needs of the environment with the needs of the economy, with the needs of society? Uh, and, and, you know, these really are tough decisions. The mining industry tells us that mining in the deep sea is better than mining on land. And I think I need to present some part of their argument. They argue that we're not, it doesn't displace people. There's no impact to food production, although that one might not actually be true if fisheries are harmed. There's no impact to freshwater supplies, no significant risk of disaster. Well, depends on how you define that. There's no impact to soil formation, erosion, historical and cultural values. But there is the potential for irreversible damage to an ecosystem that we don't yet understand very well. And there can be some spin-off effects on ecosystem services that people do care about, like fisheries, carbon cycling. And I actually think I included a, some more details about this in, in a couple of slides. Um, so, but the questions are there. Should we be looking harder at the decision to mine the deep sea? Do we really need those minerals or can we reduce our consumption and recycle to the point where we can manage with what we have now on land? So, so where are we with minerals mining in international waters? Well, for one thing, we have an international seabed authority that's mandated both to develop the resources and manage those resources as the common heritage of, the man of mankind at the same time that that agency is supposed to protect and preserve the marine environment and to promote marine scientific research and coordinate and disseminate this. And it's very difficult for that agency to do both of these things without having separate independent arms. So at this point, we have many exploration claims in international waters, but no exploitation areas yet. Uh, the assumption is that those, all of those exploration 
areas will transition to exploitation areas. Maybe not all, but many. Um, there are no regulations in place yet, especially environmental regulations. They're in draft form being prepared and argued about by the International Seabed Authority now, but they don't yet exist and there hasn't been an opportunity for full stakeholder input on those. They are arguing about whether the environmental guideline management will be mandatory regulations or just guidelines. It's a little bit scary if they become guidelines because then they sound kind of optional. Um, but there's a real need for a strategic research agenda to inform the mi decisions about mining. Um, and right now, there are no overarching environmental objectives put out by the International Seabed Authority to guide uh, regulation and to guide mining activities, and we think they need this. Um, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, it could be the International Seabed Authority really needs an independent arm to manage the environment. So I, I want to uh, leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is that future generations might actually need the functions and services provided by the deep sea um, that aren't the mineral resources. And, People don't think very often about all the different ways that the deep sea helps us, but we do get fish, shellfish, we get oil and gas, and we're getting now pharmaceuticals and industrial agents and biomaterials out of the deep sea. We know that it provides habitat and food support and refuge and nursery grounds for many of the species that are important to our commercial species. There are important regulating services provided by the deep, deep ocean. That Ocean, deep ocean takes up a huge amount of our excess heat and carbon dioxide. Biodiversity is a resource itself, and in fact, our deep sea biodiversity is really like a living library that's probably going to help us solve our problems of the future. And of course, it's important for scientific research. It's where we put all our communication cables, and it's been a source of artistic inspiration and, and education as well. So I'd like to leave you with this cartoon that came out in 1983. This is a very popular cartoon among deep sea scientists. The women are saying, I don't know why, but I don't care about, uh, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And I really, really hope that in the 35 years that this cartoon has come out and all that we've learned about the deep ocean, that we really do begin to care about the deep ocean and recognize that we need to keep it healthy to be able to pretty much solve our, our future problems. Um, and I'm going to leave you with an Isaac Asimov quote that I like because it makes us think hard. No, no sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not the world as it is, but the world as it will be. And trying to envision what our world is going to be in 100 years and what we're going to need out of the ocean is is tough, but I think we need to be doing that. And with that, I thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what we'd like to do, interestingly, um, as we get started again, um, when I listed the questions I might be asking Lisa before I knew what she wanted to ask you, my first question for her was going to be, why should we care about the deep ocean? And I just listened to her whole talk, and I, it's pretty obvious why we should care about the deep ocean. So I don't need to ask that question. But we do need to ask the question still, how can we get that message to more people? So um, I don't know if you've chosen a representative, but does anybody want to be the first volunteer to come to the microphone and give us some thoughts on how we can move the needle on awareness and interest in the deep ocean? Well, we were, I was pretty depressed. <laughs> Um, feeling very hopeless uh, because the issue that I think we really need to talk about is enforcement, let alone when we make rules. We can't even enforce regulations on whaling internationally right now. And I had said, I baited the issue, said we're going to send the Peace Corps in to uh, monitor and to enforce these regulations. But obviously, or maybe not so obviously, it's going to be education and getting our next generation of voters to care. So we came to the conclusion that maybe David Attenborough, before he completely retires, will do a series on deep, or, or at least discuss in more detail, deep sea um, habitat and diversity and thereby impacting on mining. Actually, 
He just did. <laughs> Have you seen it? We're reinventing the wheel. No, I'm not yet. But no, it's. I am uh, a fan. I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix. It's a, just amazing. The, they did a, a, a one or more shows on the deep the, in the Blue Planet series. The sad thing is, and this is a personal, not particularly our group comment, but we're preaching a little bit to the choir, even the group here. And we're, whether we can make it mandatory in schools, because we have a lot of deniers still out there and people who don't want to watch nature programs or think that scientists lie or whatever, the reasoning behind it. I mean, we, we've elected an administration with uh, at least a promise that thankfully hasn't come true that we're going to accelerate mining on land and one member of our group said, well, that might take a little pressure then off the deep sea bed mining. <laughs> but um, uh, there is a real chasm that's increasing between what perhaps some of us think are, is an obvious value in biological diversity and in ecosystems and what other people feel is less valuable. And I, and our school system is not doing the best job of disseminating factual information. And kids are not listening. And I don't know, our kids are really smart using technology, but have they really learned that much more about biology than when we had Silent Spring? So thank you for a very thoughtful summary. Um, the other groups have a lot to live up to now. Um, so you, you came up with a suggestion, and before you were done, it was already accomplished. So David Attenborough has done a program on the deep sea. So that's pretty powerful. Can I just make a comment? Oh, oh, sure, yeah, sure. I, I totally agree with you that it's the next generation or next generations that we need to focus on. These, this is going to be their planet, and they need to be well informed. And it's, it's a hard task, but that's where we should focus. I also truly believe that every college degree should come with an environmental science course requirement, which almost never happens. Um, and it shouldn't, you know, to me, it's as important as calculus or whatever else students have to learn in college is learning how this planet works. So something to try at UCSD. Well, we should at least be able to do it at the college level. And high school would be even better because you get a broader spectrum. Yeah. So I'm going to be arbitrary and just kind of move our way around the room. Does anybody from the group up here want to speak up? <laughs> you've, you've selected a volunteer? I think that um, I was in the sustainability field for a while and then left. And I've noticed since coming back that there's a much more hopeful and positive trend. And maybe that's just I've grown and I see things from a different light. And so I think we kind of talked about um, presenting things in terms of we can make our lives better now, like this is a labor of love and something positive we can bring. And I heard a talk the other day at UCSD about how in marketing, if you can get enough people on board with something, and I think it was like four to ten percent of that market to be interested in green purchasing, that that's enough to get the market to shift, to get like huge industries to shift. So I think maybe we won't get everyone on board, but if we can get the critical mass, which might not be as much as we think it needs to be, then that will be enough to get what we, the protection that we need, so. Okay, great. So um, if we can do something moving in the right direction, maybe it doesn't have to be a lot, and so we should just give up because we can't get everybody. I think that might be an important lesson of that. Um, I don't know exactly where your group's divided up. Anybody around in here? Uh, Want to speak up? I'll offer a cynical comment. I grew up in West Virginia, and I hate mountaintop removal. And I keep thinking, if we'll do that to the environment above water to get coal, what will we do when we need rare earth metals for all these gadgets that we love? Given that choice, I, I have a hunch the mining of the rare earth stuff will win. The second, when scientists receive a cease and desist order, who covers their legal costs? That seems to me like a bullying kind of uh, approach by the industries to, to put a stop to stuff they don't want to hear. 
Well, you're right about that latter point. Uh, I, I think that the universities ha all have legal departments. Um, we didn't get as far, I didn't get as far as consulting mine. I, we, we didn't really think that this person had a particular case, but I just wanted to throw it out as an example that once you wade into the issues that are controversial like this, you run the risk of facing legal action. And it's not for everybody. Uh, in, in terms of you know, the, the first thing you said, I, I'm not, um, there are some people that think it's inevitable that we're going to mine the seabed. And that's why the scientists should be in there, making sure that there are strict environmental regulations and so on. And um, I think it's, it's going to happen eventually. I just don't think we're ready yet, and that the longer it can be put off, the more likely we are to be able to get answers on how to protect the environment better, and um, yeah, and 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 know more so that we can make better regulations. This is a it's an an interesting trade-off um, to, to think about. Um, on the one hand, the fear that seems realistic that those resources are going to be exploited and, and all of that biodiversity could be lost. But on the other hand, if you don't do anything, you kind of guarantee that that's going to happen and probably sooner. So the alternative is, as I, as I think I'm reading what you're saying, is to be involved in that process, to be understanding the sea now, and to perhaps find ways that you could mine those resources without losing that biodiversity. If that might be something way down the line, but might be a way to have our cake and eat it too. I don't know whether you want to even go there. But <laughs> yeah, I think over time we're going to find more and more resources down there that aren't minerals and recognize that it's going to be a trade-off. There are genetic, an amazing wealth of genetic resources. There's huge amounts of genetic diversity. And I didn't take the time because I needed to keep the presentation short, but People are using hydrothermal vent tube worm blood as a template for making artificial blood. They're using deep sea coral skeletons as a template for bone replacements in people. They've, there's just so many different kinds of new products coming out of there. And the more and more we explore, the more we discover. And so people are going to start to realize what the trade-offs are. And they may choose not to go to all of those habitats for minerals. I don't know. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I have to use the microphone so that because sure. it's so thanks. Um, to your last point, isn't part of what you're saying though, um, kind of talking about um, immediate gains versus potential long term unknown gains? And that's a really hard conversation to have right now and regulate right now because anything that you set up is predicated on the existing knowledge. You're exactly right. And um, humans are really terrible at making trade-offs between the present and the future. We almost always go for what we need in the present. So it's, it's a challenge. And um, I, you know, it may be possible that, there, that the, we can live without some thousands of square kilometers of seafloor without totally damaging the planet and its cycles and processes. I think people just need to slow down and learn a little bit more to be able to make that determination. It seems to me that the ocean right now serving the humanity is food. And I believe with this climate change, the ocean may become a more important source of that food. And I think that may, in fact, take precedent over minerals. Uh, your thoughts on the matter? Well, actually, the ocean is probably the greatest climate mitigator. <laughs> the ocean takes up 93% of the heat, excess heat in the atmosphere. So you know, our temperature has been going up and up. If we didn't have the ocean, it would be skyrocket. It would be hotter than we could tolerate even now. Same with carbon dioxide. It takes up a, over a quarter of our excess carbon dioxide, and it's acidifying as a result. 
So both the warming and the acidification, and the, if, the other thing people don't realize is that that warming is causing oxygen loss in the ocean. And all of those things are going to impair its ability to provide food for us, and we're already seeing that. Um, and this is one of my areas of research, is studying the effects of climate change on, on deep ecosystems and deep fisheries and so on. And, and so I'm not 100% sure that um, it's going, we, we, we pretty much maxed out our wild fisheries. I do think aquaculture is going to increase in the ocean, including open ocean aquaculture, and that we, there's potential to get more food and more protein out of the ocean in that realm. Um, than we do now. Um, but you know, it, the same people who, who are after food aren't necessarily the same people who are after minerals. So I'm not sure it's, it becomes a trade-off. You know, if you think about, the, I mean, as a, as a planet, we need food. But the ocean is very important to subsistence and artisanal fishers from less developed countries in particular. Um, as a source of food, and they are not necessarily the same people or conglomerates going after the deep sea minerals. Yeah. So, um, any of the other groups that somebody could speak for their thoughts? Um, Mitzi, come. Thanks. Along your comments about having the population slow down a bit, again, I, I think the population needs to slow down a bit, and that curve of its population going up and up can be. Uh, addressed by leveling off and maybe coming down. Uh, the availability of uh, birth control and other types of things just uh, needs to be addressed without the education, or maybe with the education, but the resources for that. That's a big question, and obviously not specific to the deep sea, because we're not asking for birth control in the deep sea. There's I think. two parts of this equation. It's population, growth, and demand. We have the ability to work on both of those. They're very con controversial in some cases. <laughs> Any other groups want to follow up with uh, thoughts about uh, we need some more positive ways to try and help the public understand why this matters? I just have a question. I have an ulterior motive because my first husband was uh, a geologist on the deep sea drilling project at your institution years ago, and then that dissolved after a while. So what is Scripps Institution of Oceanography doing about the problems and that you brought up? What are their solutions and thoughts? Well, if you, you probably know that Scripps is just a collection of strong-minded people <laughs> who work on what they want to work on. Um, I would say Scripps as a entity isn't doing a whole lot. Um, I, for six years, I was the director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. And we've had um, one of the research initiatives has been in the deep sea and to raise awareness and draw attention and, and uh, try to bring science to uh, the creation of policy. So I would say the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, which I helped to found, is, um, and we can consider Scripps one of the founders. It's an international group of 550 deep sea scientists who all care about these issues of humans in the deep ocean and environmental management of the deep ocean. And also, the um, Scripps leads a lot of deep ocean observing programs. The Argo program, maybe you've heard of the Argo floats. And the Ocean Sites program, they sent, so Dean Remick just won an award, actually, for the Argo, <laughs> creating the Argo program. And the Ocean Sites are moorings around the world. And um, Lynn Talley leads Go Ship, which is repeat hydrography. So Scripps is at the forefront of observing in the shallow and the deep ocean. And those observations are contributing to a much better understanding of climate change and of all change in the global change in the future. So I would say that's, that's part of the answer. <laughs> so still looking for more ideas about how to help the public understand and care about the deep sea? Anything that we missed from yes. other groups? Oh, Stanley. Yeah. We ran out of time, so we didn't quite get all the way through this. But the other possibility is to say, what if we figured out better ways to avoid using some of those elements, like the rare earth elements. 
So, so that's a case where research into new approaches that will have more effective ways of having solar panels or the batteries that drive hybrid vehicles and so on could overwhelm the need and therefore the financial gain that's associated with that. Now, that's in a way a long-term endeavor, but so is education and all these other things. No, I think that that's really important. I, I mentioned recycling. We did, I mean, we don't even recycle the elements in our cell phones, and um, I, I'm not sure what happens to those 2,000. The two, there's huge amounts of lanthanum in every Prius battery. I have a Prius, so <laughs> you know, I feel bad about that. But um, I, I didn't talk about um, phosphorites, but that's another mineral that people are interested in mining out of deep water, but it's mostly within uh, exclusive economic zones. Phosphorus, they're interested in for fertilizer, which people claim we're running out of on land. But the truth of the matter is, if we recycled our sewage, we could get all the phosphorus that we probably needed to grow crops on land. And so there's huge amounts of research that need to go into just the process and mechanisms for recycling, from sociological research to get, you know, how to get people to do it, all the way to actually how to do it economically. Okay, so any other thoughts on that question? So what, what I've heard so far is that um, a lot of focus on education. Um, one specific tool is to try and have visuals that work um, and uh, having people who can speak well for this would be someone like David Attenborough. I was thinking when you've brought that up that Lisa Levin does a wonderful job of that, so we could have her do the same. But as I think several people have, have noted, in a way we're, we're preaching to the choir when we have this group here, why would other people be interested in this? And so I'm going to turn back, this back to you now. So there's, there may be a deeper question of not just caring about the deep sea, but of caring about science and being a literate in terms of science is, should we perhaps be focusing on that goal first and, and as, I mean, I can see this going two directions. One is to say, focus on science literacy generally and hope that the deep sea interest will follow. And the other was to use deep sea interest as a way to promote science literacy. But maybe there's even another way to look at yeah, that. Yeah, well, think? of course, science is the big picture. I think the environment, the planet and the environment is a good place to start, really. Um, making sure people understand how it works and that there's consequences for everything we do and every decision we make and every product we buy. Well, given that importance, then all of us, um, whether we are at UCSD, where we could lobby for our undergraduate programs to have an environmental science requirement, or your children, or your neighbors, or your school districts to get them to put this into the elementary schools or other colleges. Um, that might be something that would help move the needle in the right direction, and maybe not convert everybody, but at least, again, maybe it's enough. So. Yeah, and I mean, I think this, the schools have gotten pretty good about, te I mean, as my kids went through school, I was amazed at what they were learning about the ocean and the land and the wetlands and di different kinds of animals and plants, I, things I never certainly learned in school. So I do think that we're on the right trajectory. Okay, good. Um, and by the way, I don't know if people wrote questions on cards. If you did, please pass them to your right and to the back, and then Becca can pick those up in case you have any questions you'd like to And You can continue writing those as we go on. And while you're doing that, and you're also welcome to come to the microphone to ask questions if you'd like. While you're doing that, one of the things that um, we've touched on, but I'd like you to elaborate on a little bit, is who benefits if these resources are exploited? I mean, right now we're kind of just talking generally about this, but um, I know you and I have talked about it a bit. It's, it's supposed to be equitably distributed somehow, but how does that work? Well, there, there's no benefit sharing regime that's been planned yet, which is a little bit scary given that any profits from mining in international water are supposed to be shared. And uh, there's been a few workshops, as I understand about it, but no, no real plan because people believe mining is still five to 10 years away from actually happening in the international waters. 
might happen sooner in national waters. I didn't talk about that. But um, who's really benefiting? I mean, honestly, the industries that are teaming. So I should say that companies can't make those claims I showed you. It has to be done by nations. Okay? So only countries can claim. But each country either has a national mining company like China does, or they team up with a private mining company. And those private mining companies are going to make gazillions amounts of dollars if they go ahead and mine those resources. I didn't give you any numbers, but the value in those polymetallic nodules and massive sulfides is huge. People wouldn't be going after them unless there was a lot of money to be made. And also, the small countries, you probably saw on my list, places like Nauru and Tonga, countries that have a few thousand people, basically, um, they see dollar signs. They see a way to get money, these island nations, without, um, well, they just see it as a source of income. But there is this thing called the resource curse. Whenever there's been mining on these small islands on land, it's really created a lot of environmental damage and not been good for the people. And mostly the people haven't benefited. And I'm guessing that would be the case even with deep seabed mining. So I, I, have, I have a general idea of benefits that some countries and people in those countries would see from resources that could be exploited. But I'm not as clear on how consequences might occur. So um, for me, one of the consequences of mining those deep sea sites would be a loss of biodiversity. But that ends up being sort of philosophical and esoteric for most people. That, and to make a connection to their lives is going to be hard. What consequences can we say would affect nations, and how would those consequences be equitably distributed? Well, one of the problems is we don't know the answer. I mean, we know that there'll be huge sediment plumes, that they'll go up in the water. They could affect the water column species, which migrate up and down, which eventually feed the fish at the surface, and they could be de deleterious to the surface fisheries um, that many nations rely on and, and the provide food for people. Um, there could be problems um, on land. A lot of the, um, the ships and the hardware and everything will have to have ports to go to. And of course, then there's increased uh, accidents, oil spills, and damage, and infrastructure that gets built on land. People might get displaced. I mean, there's a whole reverber societal reverberations. But in terms of the ecological consequences and how that affects the whole ocean and how, you know, how much carbon sequestration we're going to lose and so on, I think people really don't know yet. It's just such an unknown system. Yeah, because yeah. I, I can, again, crudely imagine how allocation might occur, and I, I'm not in favor of any of these, but you might say, OK, to the extent that we extract x from the deep sea, we're going to distribute it according to your population. We're going to distribute it according to your GDP. But if, if you were going to do that, then how do you fairly distribute the consequences? So yeah. if, I do, if I do mining in this area, and because of sediment and plumes that affect the local fisheries in that area, a nation may lose a primary food source. So how do you fairly distribute Yeah, the consequences that? never fall uniformly, do they? Um, I, I should have said, in terms of distributing profits, it's, it may be that um, it's not going to be big checks handed out to every country of the world, necessarily. The emphasis is on developing countries. Of, and only the countries that have signed and ratified the law of the sea are even eligible to claim those resources or to get any of the benefits. I should point out, I, I actually, I didn't put up a map of who has and hasn't, but probably most of you notify, know that the US has not signed and ratified the law of the sea, so we're not even part of this story exactly. Um, and, uh, but they're talking about promoting scientific research, um, technology transfer as part of the benefit sharing, um, funds that, that would be accrued and then 
I don't really don't know how they're going to distribute them. Yeah, well, I mean, it, these are, the, we're talking about the future, right? So we've got to figure yeah. out how to think about it in advance. So um, this is leading to the question I have here, but it, it is, the, the question now is, do, does the International Seabed Authority apply only to nations who've signed the law of the sea? How does that work? Signed and ratified, yes. Yeah, so. But a lot of, most nations have. Okay. But, um, the, US but there, the U.S. hasn't, and there's a few in South America that haven't, and a few in Eastern Europe and various okay. places. So yeah. the, by being signatories to that, the nations are granting some sort of, and this is the question, some sort of enforcement power to the International Seabed Authority? What can they do? What, what, <laughs> how can they have any yeah, say? Yeah, enforcement's going to be tough. I mean, but technology, hopefully, will adv have advanced enough that people, we certainly know where ships are now. So all the ships can have, I forget the name of the vessel tagging system, that, so you can see where they are. Um, in terms of watching what's happening at the bottom of the ocean, we eventually will have the technology to do that in real time, probably. Um, so it, it's a challenge, but um, I, I think those areas are so remote, and we're talking about mining at, at 12,000 feet, you know, or, or 15,000 feet. Um, and it's, uh, I guess once they're in there, starting, it might be very hard to get anybody to stop. <laughs> but. I, I, the enforcement is not an area that I, I'm so familiar with what they're planning. Yeah, well, I, I, I suspect from what you've said, nobody's planning that yet. I mean, nobody's thought that far ahead. So, I mean, those are some of the questions that have to be asked. You know, I'm excited and intrigued uh, about, you know, all of this additional biodiversity we still don't know anything about. Um, and it would be a shame to lose it. And your talk today, I think, helped express that for all of us. So I really appreciate hearing from you. So I want to thank you. Please. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.